think. Hello again. Hello, 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 and welcome one and all to a brand new series of the Arboricultural Association's Wednesday webinars. Woo! My name's John Parker, Chief Executive Officer at the Association and your host for this evening and for the next 14 weeks or so of top quality, action-packed online goodness. We've got some amazing speakers, some great topics lined up for you, so I do hope to see you all as the weeks go on and there's more information about all of that on our website. I'm already finding the chat very distracting over here, that's why I keep looking over there. Uh, please feel free to say hello in the chat, as many of you are doing already. Make sure you select everyone when you do so. Let us know where you're watching from. I have to say I've been very, very lucky during my recent travels to have met quite a few uh, regular webinar watchers over the last few months. So if I happen to have seen you somewhere about in the world this year, please do say hello. Uh, it's been great to meet lots of you. Uh, if you've got any questions, please use the Q&A button. You do get CPD or CEUs uh, for attending this. And as part of the registration form to access the webinar, you'll have been asked to enter your ISA details if you want to get CEUs. That's the only way we can submit it to the ISA uh, and you've got to stay for at least 80% of the session and we can't accept CEU requests after the event. So uh, there you go. Don't blame me. I'm just the messenger. Uh, if you selected the option to be sent a certificate of attendance when you registered, then as if by magic, you will get one of those after the webinar. As ever, we've been very busy here at the Malt House in Stonehouse in Gloucestershire, capital of the tree world. There's loads of stuff been going on. But one thing I wanted to highlight, because it might be of interest to you all, is a short video we've produced, which I'd like to play to you. It's less than two minutes long, so don't panic. It's called What is Arboriculture? And it's intended to be used by anyone who wants to communicate just how many wonderful roles there are in our sector. So just give me a second, and I hope this is going to work. Uh, if I do this... Can I go home now? Yeah, you can go home. Who are you? Oh, I remember. I, I knew I had to do something. I remember now. Um, so, right, there we go. I hope you liked that. Uh, that video is available on YouTube. If you just search for what is our boriculture, and the video is courtesy of my colleague Maisie and our marketing team. Uh, but the whole of the team has been doing loads of great stuff since we last saw you. Uh, so it would be remiss of me not to say... That if you uh, want to get involved and be part of our international family, further support our work, you might like to even consider signing up as a member or making a donation or something like that. Uh, we've got loads of webinars coming up. I won't bore you with them, but uh, go online, sign up to the webinars. We'll be putting the links in the chat. But tonight, it's very exciting. It's a book launch. We're at a book launch right now, which is why I am so smart. It's my great pleasure to welcome my dear friend and the association's newest author, Mr. Ted Green, MVOMBE, who is going to give us a polished and perfectly rehearsed talk about the soon-to-be best-selling Tree Time, 
Tales of a Layman's Lifelong Adventure with Trees and Tree Folk. Ted, how you doing, mate? Yeah, great stuff. Now, you, normally we get a picture of you up and me, and um, I'm looking at Sarah, and she might do it. So I might want to go for a wee in a minute. That's nothing that nobody would Fallen, expect. Falling on deaf ears. It's a waste of time doing these things. These tree, tree people don't have a sense of humour. So but there's the book, and we've actually got that as a picture by um, Paul McCartney's daughter, Mary. Mary McCartney took that picture. And just to show you that, you know, the people are out there all over the world that love trees, and, and especially something like this. With so much history in it, so come on. Where's where's a picture of them, um, John and me? There's supposed to be a picture of John and me. Please, yes, there you go. Two scrappy sods, and this is when for me, what we want, what to push on the the importance of arboriculture and the people. This was the this was the beginning. I asked John if we could do one of these. Uh, what is a tree? And a tree ecologist, and he grabbed it in one. And this is what this is what it's all about. Um, and I've forgotten the lines already. But there you go, a lovely great big open tree, not a forest tree, and two two gentlemen at, in their best clothes, just to talk to you today. And so we we I've got four friends, but I just want to do a little bit of history about this book because. Originally, I, um, I was talking to John as the, um, the the COVID began, lockdown began, and I said to him, I've just finished a book, and it's going to be called, um, uh, <laughs> I've forgotten his name, um, I'll think of it in a minute. Uh, and um, Read the tree. Read the trees, read the trees. And there's a lovely story there already, because one of their old arborist friends, I said, I said to him about the book, and we're going to call it Read the Trees. And he laughed his head off because he said, I've been reading the trees for 40 years. And that led me to something too, because I thought one of the reasons I'm trying to raise the profile and get you people to have the confidence to be what I call as professional as anybody else, because you are, it occurred to me that all my life, in my uh, adventure with trees and tree people, I've been talking to tree ecologists. And here we are about to start the next book, which is going to be called An Introduction to Tree Ecology. And you're, you're already doing it. And my friend, dear old Kevin, we get him on in a minute. He, is, he will take over from me on this subject. But I think it's so important for you to gain the confidence to realise just how you are really in charge of tree ecology. Not the foresters, they grow trees, and they can't take that away from them. They are brilliant at growing trees. And now we voted for Brexit, we need our trees more than you think, and it will happen. So come on, John, you're not even said a word yet. What you're going to say? I'm just listening. I'm enjoying it. I'm a member of the audience. Then I'm just. I'm looking at a picture of me. What's not to like? Well, so anyway, going back to the story. So there I am saying I'm just fin just finishing this book, and I'm looking for something to do. And it was him that said, "Why don't you write your memories or memoirs of your time with trees and people?" I got it in one, and this is why, if you like, we we started this thing here. So I got the idea of writing the book, gave, and John took up the idea of this what's a tree. Because for me, on the outside looking in, I see myself, I, I see you as the real arborist, the re-tree ecologist, and I've learned so much from you, so much, so much. And, I, and it's, it's an honour, really, to be here actually talking to people that they made their life trees. Because I know from the fact and the experiences in talking to you people that most of you, it's not just a job. It's not a job. It's, a, it's a, maybe a career, 
um, but it's because you love doing it. And, and I can't, I can't get enough of that. I think that is what we've got to push is your association with trees. So anyway, so back to John. So he started um, organizing this conference and I started um, writing the second book. And the second book was you. And what happened was, of course, is that um, my way of putting money back into conservation and their dear old blue planet was to say to John, I'll pay for everything. And that's what we've done. So the whole, whole of this book is down to me and the people that have helped me to do it. And in doing, in doing so, then what it's allowed, the, the profits from this book will all go to John and we will start this tree ecology. So we start thinking about it. We've not really, I'm not really got my head around how we're going to do it, but that's the idea. Dedicated people writing a book to help everybody because it's fundamental to me just how little we know about trees. And most of what, um, I mean, John's smiling all the time. So I've got a still of him on the picture. I'm smiling because you said all the profits will go to John. And for legal reasons, I just have to say in the chat that they won't all go to John, they'll go to the Art Association. That was, that's yeah. why I was smiling. Yeah, anyway, come on, John. Have a, have a, have a couple of words while I take a, a breath. What do you think? It's working, isn't it? It's working. Uh, yeah, I think it's working. I think the Wiser Tree Conference was a, a brilliant start in, in beginning the conversation that you wanted to start about tree ecology. And uh, this book, you know, well, you're going to talk lots more about it, and I hope everyone out there buys a copy. But the amazing thing about this book for me, Ted, is on every page you've sort of uh, posed questions or made statements that could probably form the basis of a PhD thesis. It's, uh, it's a book that asks more questions than it answers, I think. Oh, wonderful stuff. And, yeah, and so. Um, so a little bit about the history then. Um, can we have the next picture, please? I don't know what it is. Yes. So this is the team, really, that, that, that have made this book, made it. And it, when you get it, I hope you'll see it like I do, although it's my own book in a theory. I see it as a possession because it's more, it's more than a book. So on the, on the right hand side, You've got Sarah. She's frightened stiff about speaking tonight, so I won't frighten you that, Sarah. But Sarah, and I've got I've got a statement from a friend of mine, which said, said he's a he's a wordy, and he hates um he, he hates um I've lost it. He he hates my the way I write. But I think I'm partially dyslexic anyway. So this is the classic Ted. Um yeah so. I've got a statement about about Sarah. Hmm. Do you want one of it, Mark Twain? Got one about Mark Twain. Anyway, I'll come back to Sarah. Uh, then right behind her, always at the back, always, always will stand back is Jill. And um, this would never have happened over the years without Jill managing me. And, um, uh, oh God. It's been quite an adventure, Ted, I must say. It's been a bit of a roller coaster, a bit of a tree ride. Uh, but, um, what I, I think the thing for me is that, um, uh, it's introduced me to so many fantastic people, um, you know, in, in other, in the UK as well as other parts of the world. Um, some really wonderful people who are all part of this tree family, true brothers and sisters, and um, we've we've had such generous hosts and you know such wonderful experiences, not only with people but with some of their absolutely stupendous trees. So that's really brilliant. But I think what are you correct? Are you trying to find Dick's um, statement? Yeah. What Dick said was that. Um, He'd tried to edit Ted's work in the past, some of his writing in the past. I know Izzy Burrell tried to edit some of it, and I certainly have had several goes at it. And none of us 
could get get it right. Yeah, they always rejected it. We always turned it into something else. But Sarah has done the most amazing job. I don't know how she's done it, but she's turned Ted's typical voice um, that everybody's heard at conferences and things like that. She's turned that voice into a really great read, um, and and Ted's voice comes through it. It's yeah. just fantastic. So um, there's a professional editor for you, and a tremendous um, uh, uh, empathy with Ted, and somehow has managed to do what <laughs> many others have tried and failed at enormously. I well, think it, I'll put it, it into words. It's been yeah. a great. It's been a great journey and privilege for me to do it it really has because the book was there the readable book was all there Ted I didn't do that much to it I just helped the words get out and we had all those conversations that helped find the phrases that you really wanted to use and it's been a, it's been great for me it's been great yeah and then I, I better say but anyway it's in the book um and then there's Julian Julian, I never know what to say. What, what, what are you, Julian? What do we call you? Because you put the book together. What, what, what's your what, what's your real title? Julian's the designer, and he he's he's a book designer, and he um, masterminded bringing it all together to knit the pictures and the text together, didn't he? Yeah, and he's a self-publisher, Ted, of tree fantastic tree books as well. So you know, there's some wonderful. Um, the great British tree story, all sorts of things out there that Julian put together. So a great, you know, another person who's got a lot of um, sympathy with the subject matter and what you're trying to convey to people um, and great skill at putting it together now after so many books that he's published himself um, at putting it together and um, knowing um you know, what, what looks best on a page, but also nagging us like mad to make sure we had the highest resolution images to make the book look good. And having looked at the book, the images are really, really good. So I, I bless the day that uh, Julian really encouraged us to put that extra, extra mile into it to get that looking, to get them as good as we possibly could. Of course, some of your photographs are so ancient, um, and I think we're going to see a few ancient ones, that um, it's impossible to make them any better. But we, Julian did his absolute best to get get it looking really as crisp and as good colour as he possibly could, plus a great printer as well. Yeah, and you can all see my penthouse behind, um, and I live on the, the, the first floor with a looking out over Windsor Park. I can't hear him whether they're laughing or not. Anyway, yes, so we have, can we have a look at the next slide? So I thought you people would like that because obviously this is the real beginnings of my, uh, if you like, 90-year adventure. And there's a, a lovely Rhode Island Red. They've caught the popular chicken of that time. And here I am actually if you like, communicating with a chicken. And I'm learning something. The chicken is quite happy with me, and I'm quite happy with a chicken. But as you can see, I'm wading about in all that mud and shit and full of E. coli, full of E. coli, the things that kill thousands of people today. And yet here, here, here I am, and I grew up in that sort of situation, communicating with wildlife. And that has been the most lucky thing in my life, I think, is being, um, if you like, uh, communicating with nature some, for some, so, so early in my life. Yeah. And, um, anyway, so next one, please. I'm going to have to slow down a bit because we get through it. So really early on in this adventure of mine, as I grew up, and this was probably when I was about six. And this is where I am meeting Canadian lumberjacks because they were over here uh, taking the role of air lumberjacks or air tree men that had gone to war. 
and then we're over here cutting our trees down and this is a concrete road when it was just freshly laid and it was going to be one of the place big parking places for all the tanks and trucks and stuff like that for D-Day and no no small boy can uh, resist doing it so I walked up there <laughs> and that's there now forever but that probably was the real beginning of, of myself with trees because I was already beginning to ask lots of questions of people. So I couldn't turn around to me, Dad. He wasn't there. So you, talk, you spoke to everybody, and I learned to speak to everybody, and I learned to not be wrong. And I think it's a good one for all of you to think. Being wrong, you learn something. Just think about it. You learn something by being wrong. And the two, if you like, professions where you can do that, and this is my, my observation, is agriculture and forestry. And I met the foresters a long time before I met the arborists. And I stood, because I was dealing with academics all my life and discussions. And they were all knife in front of stabbing and knife back in stabbing. Um, but I met these foresters and they were discussing whatever. And I listened to what they said. They took all the, the, um, the comments, but equally at the same time, they would stand there with maybe a group of 60 people and just say, I got it wrong. Or I would not do it that way again. And I was already in the university listening to people taking the pee out of everybody. And I, I thought, these are my people. These people are well adjusted and they, they're, they're quite happy to show their mistakes. And then when I met the arborists, I found the same thing. And it was something about they're all tree people. They're, they're, they have a different whatever. And I've always said to or any young woman that I meet, if you're going to get married, marry a forester or a bear still marry an arborist because you will find people that are so well adjusted to living and, and the, where they are. They are people, or you are people that are at peace with themselves. But what you do lack, and this is the arborist, arborist is you lack Con conservation. That's right. Con you lack com uh, com confidence in yourselves. You 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 don't see yourself as one of the oldest professions. And I'll get round to that at some stage. But because you are, but nobody can question you. There isn't a professor. There isn't an academic uh, blah de blah pumpy pump that can question what you say because they don't know. You are the arborists. You are the profession. And, and the foresters are not far behind you. Yeah, okay. So that was telling you about the, the, oh yeah, well I will tell you that story because, um, these young Canadians were dropping these big oak trees. And if you go there now, there's one left. And uh, we don't know why they left it. So you can speculate. And I just wonder if they looked at this great big tall oak and thought, I can't, they can't bring themselves to do that because they didn't have those trees. They're probably dealing with conifers and, and stuff like that. And to see this majestic oak a hundred years ago, or whenever it was, 90 years ago or whatever, and they, they couldn't, they could not bring themselves to cut it down. So I'm in the process when I meet the right person of saying that tree should have a plaque. That tree should have a plaque to all the people, all those young men and women that died in the war to keep us being able to speak to each other tonight. And that's something to remember. You're all lucky. I mean, I lived through it and I know about it and I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Um, uh, hello. Um, uh, hang on a minute, Ted. You've got to tell people what the road is all about. They're all worried, wondering what this road is all about. Yes, I have said you, it. Have you mentioned the footprints? Yeah, I did that. Where I, were you? I think they're wondering if they're supposed to be seeing a picture of a tree now. Oh, no. No, no, I've left. Well, it was a case of space. 
They can imagine the tree. It's just a tree. You see them all day. What are you going to yeah. see another bloody tree for? Let's go. And say, hey, Sarah, yes. Now, this is much later in my life, but actual fact, um, this is in the high Cévennes in the middle of France, quite high up. And when I was there, I experienced something which I feel I experienced as that young boy. What I should say is that my father went missing in the war and we waited four and a half years to find out whether he's actually dead, dead or alive. And so I wandered the woods, often with a stray dog that recognised you were going somewhere. And I was always out in the woods. And of course, I got all the funny diseases from stress. And, and so I lived in, I lived amongst trees and woods and wood pasture and the old oaks at Windsor. And we were here in the ice of then. And I stood there and I felt an atmosphere, an atmosphere that those trees brought. They brought an atmosphere and it was the atmosphere of probably a hundred years before when the old boys, the old French, Arborists, I want to call them arborists, were up there cutting those trees on rotation. And you could, you could smell the horses or the mules, which took that timber back down to the valleys. You could, you could smell the tobacco from the old clay pipes that those people, those old, um, foresters used or woodmen. And, um, as I say, smell the horses and hear the horses snorting. And you smell the wood smoke, automatically they would have a fire somewhere. And there I was. I was gone, I'd gone back maybe a hundred or two hundred years. And I could feel that those people that were around me. And that is a feeling which I think a lot of you people probably take for granted because you don't realize it's happening to you. But there's so many people in the world that will never ever get that feeling. Of being amongst trees. I, I guarantee it. Go next time you're out, go and just touch a tree. Although you're going to cut the blooming thing down, I'll get annoyed. But just go there. That atmosphere and that atmosphere, I believe, in those days when I didn't know where my dad was, that probably was something that took me through it. Because I've been out there nearly every other day. I was white vaulting in these under these big oaks, massive great oak trees, big beech trees, um, lovely vistas, lots of birds and animals and everything happening. And I'm sure that's what kept me sane, not knowing where my father was. Okay, Sarah, 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 yeah. And of course, here's another one. Now this, by this time, I was a young man uh, working in a laboratory in, 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 in a university as a technician. And a technician is, is, um, is a provider of help to people doing research or education being taught. And because primarily a lot of what I was working in was plant, plant diseases. Please note, I've changed the word straight away. Plant pathology, complicated word. All you arms. For some reason, think you impress people by using complicated words which nobody understands. And my old professor said to one of the students he was dealing with, and he just said, take it away, take out three words and leave one, and by the way, put in simple language. So I'm not going to call it plant pathology. These are plant diseases. And this is, this is the start of Dutch elm disease. And I knew it was coming, so I got out to the old British treescape, massive grey elms. And you can see the rook's nest up in the trees. You can smell the land maggots, smelly things underneath. And this was the, this was the scene before Dutch elm disease. And now, if I go back to that, that particular scene, that's a bare field as far as you can see. They've all gone. In actual fact, now we've got our king in place. He took one look at this lot and I, he saw, he may have seen this picture, but
But that is all being now being planted up. He's restoring our landscape. Good on him. It's brilliant. But that's what it was. And that's how frail our landscape is. And then, of course, you've got Clara now, which is stopping. Of course, it's gone through. It's done its bit. You know, what's left is going to presumably run the course. Um, you've got and all these other diseases that are coming on the scene. But if you look at them, they do their bit and then they, they then it tails off again. It's a bit like us with COVID. You know, we went through it, took out all the susceptibles until we got a, a, a chemical to use or a, a virus. But basically, that's how these systems work. But you people are all wound up about everything. Oh, it's got a disease, it's going to die. Rubbish. How many diseases have you had without medicine and you're still here and running about? And this is the same with trees. At the moment, there's a big hiccup of going on about um, oak trees, which I really, really hate because it was all marketed in such a way that it was, it was caused by an insect. That insect, because of the ancient trees at Windsor, has always been there. So where, how and why? Because they look at the disease and not try to think why the trees are susceptible. I mean, the idea that Kalara has not been through Europe or from Asia before, I don't know. But I'm guaranteed that it, it, the trees were not susceptible like they are now. So what we should be doing is not looking at individual diseases, but look at the, why all the trees in the last 50 years have become susceptible. Yeah, why, why? And so I don't, I think, I think it's a false picture that we're told and an assumption. And I could go on for hours about that. And I think I did speak at the, the, um, the conference one year about, um, the perception of what, how you see diseases. And I don't know whether I've got a picture that might come up in a minute, um, which I'll keep. So, um, uh, and I haven't got any of you people talking. Kevin, I'd love to hear your voice. He's gone. He's gone home. No, no, I'm still there, Ted. I was just, I was just reflecting on some of those, um, stories because any of, any of us in this space who've been in the field with you will know that one of the things that you're absolutely lucid about is those memories from being a child all the way through to where you are you you seem to be able to cap capture everything and i wondered in terms of in the book what i found fascinating was that life journey you start talking about the first time you realized um or you spoke about or you used the words fungi first when you first began to realise the relevance of hollow trees in terms of Windsor Great Park and that experience of coming out of that te technician's role within the university, supporting students, looking at others, and then seeing the world afresh. Can you tell us about that? Well, I suppose it, I, I, I was working as a technician and um, I got, you got snippets from everybody and Jill says, I had no education, by the way, but Jill says I probably had the best education man could have. I enjoyed the job, but anybody that came through your door wanted some help, and they wanted that help, and they had to, you had to ask them what they were doing. What, what, what are you working on? Yeah, blah, blah, blah. And so, therefore, you learn so much about a huge span of, for want of a better word, biology. And from that, you ask, because you were, <laughs> you were asking them questions before you could help them, that also followed that you were asking questions of yourself. And I eventually uh, left the university. Thank you, Mrs. Thatcher. And, um, I went to work in conservation in the Crown Estates of Windsor. And one of the jobs my boss was, was a young woman, her name was Sarah Garner. And thank you, Sarah, I hope you get the book. But she said nobody had ever, ever surveyed these thousands of trees at Windsor. 
So they came up, or we came up with a, a biological score sheet. And I spent days going out, looking at trees. And in looking at the trees, I've got the score sheet, and I'm ticking away at the boxes and all the rest of it. At that, that time, decay was seen as bad news. Decay was seen as unsafe, unsafe and, you know, and unhealthy and everything about it. And, of course, most of the trees that were perceived hollow and unsafe, and unsafe, they cut down. So by doing that, they lost any evidence for people in the art world that wanted to see how, the, how diseases, or sorry, how decay progressed. And it was, they were called diseases. So here I was looking at these trees, and it occurred to me, especially with oaks, any oak under about 300 years would show signs so show some show some signs of if you like um decaying because there were big areas of windsor where were non intervention so i had a a classroom to go and look at these trees and see hollow trees in places and so when i was recording it occurred to me that any tree over about 300, oak trees mainly, were obviously in some form of decay. And I thought, then I looked at the ones which we estimated using John White's um, estimations, who's a brilliant bloke and I wish I'd spent more time with him. Um, anything, the older they get, the more hollow they were. So, excuse me. This is a reverse of what we think. We think a tree is unhealthy when it's hollow. Here we've got the oldest trees in Windsor, and they're all hollow. Which is so. I worked out then that that was because hollowness originally was seen by foresters is they were no good, they were no useless for work, but didn't use them, so they 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 were useless. And then, of course, um, I wrote something. Everybody laughed except one group. And sure, sure enough, within a year, we'd had the 87 hurricane. There I go, rushing around, surveying the trees. Excuse me, 900 on the ground? Where's the hollow ones? They're still up there. They didn't go down. They were hollow. They were flexible. What they did do sometimes was they snapped that where the sound woods was, Junction between the hollow. And that shut a few people up. And so, therefore, that was the start of the progression of, um, and I got the word originally from um, <laughs> Chris Baines, who was talking about um, a roadside planting. And he said, Oh, roadside planting, that's just growing downwards. So, bang, I've got it. Because the older the tree, Possibly the shorter it was, but it was hollow. It was still alive, still producing acorns or whatever. And here they were growing downwards. So you should, and I've got a, oh, I've got the, oh Christ, I've gone too far. I think I've got a picture of it. It's coming up. So I'll move on then. Can, can we have the next one then? I think. Um, but the same happened in Fontainebleau, Ted, didn't it? Oh, no, Versailles. The foresters had marked up all the forestry trees. Uh, we're going, oops, we've gone a bit up. Oh, there we go. Oh, well, yeah, okay. Well, uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah. Do you want to do this one then, Sarah? So this was my diagram of the progress of, a, of an oak. I wish we could get that line out. We haven't done that yet. But there you go. And it should go, it's a bit, it's, it's some under the pictures actually, there's one under the picture. But we've gone a little bit further with that bottom picture now because we've got what we call the Lonsdale, um, Lons you're in the book anyway, the Lons Lonsdale white columns. So you can look at that when you, you've got, you've got to buy the book anyway. So, but that just shows you how trees grow downwards when they're allowed to. But you buggers cut them down because you see them as unsafe and unhealthy and all the rest of it. Yes, uh, thanks, Sarah. Can would we... you like? Would you like me to go back now, Ten? Yes, please. 
Now, a bit further, and yeah, it's too, yeah, yeah, a bit further. Yeah, right. Now, I always get his name wrong. No, that's it, sorry. That's a picture. So, these two were, one was the inspiration at the beginning, and that's, is it Charles Watkins? John, what is Ken, it? Ken Watkins. Ken Watkins. He was the uh, founder, member, founder person behind the Woodland Trust. Yeah. And he had the vision, or he realised, that we needed to start saving our woods. He said woods, but in actual fact, when you read the um, whatever it is they write, the charter, he basically means trees. Because I suppose this could be a good place where I could talk about this, um, the myth. And I got angry last week because of the myth. And the myth is that Britain or Europe was covered with dense forest. And um, what's his name? The, 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 the sort of, um, oh, the wildlife guy always walks about with a pen knife and things. But anyway. Chris, oh, uh, Mayers. My, um, Ray Mears. Ray Mears. Well, we had Ray Mears on the other night talking about the dense forest that, you know, a squirrel could run from the Toe of Italy right to John O'Groats. Then we had um, poor old um, uh, Richard Attenborough talking about the dead. Sir David. And anyway, and um, and then later on in Country File, they were doing the same thing. So the BBC is pu putting out fake information because for 20 odd years, we have now known that most of Europe was open grown trees. Open grown trees mean arborists, don't mean foresters. Foresters, dense woodland, open grown trees and wood pasture mean you people, arborists. And I love it. And we have got to push on that because what's come out of that, of course, is that <clears throat> in trying to raise the profile of the open grown landscape, of Europe, because that's where the big animals were. You, you all know woodlands. Where you don't get animal, you don't get big animals in in woodland. They're in the open, and then if you like it, you have what I call um, two or three tier agriculture. You have the tree and all its product products. I mean, when we we go to Romania. And you can see these great big open, open grown um, beech trees. And the shepherds are out there uh, actually raking up the beech moss and sieving it. And that is either food for animals in the winter, oil for cooking, or oil for um, 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 lamb oil. And they're called fruit trees. And the guy looked at me when I said, that's a fruit tree. Because the most of Europe look at the big trees where the fruits are used and they're called fruit trees. Britain, we just think about apples and pears and plums. So that is something that's been lost and now we're trying to raise that issue again. So back to the, the open grown trees in, in, in the, in the what's her name is that, um, we are trying to get the Woodland Trust to change because they are targeting so many thousand million trees a year into the landscape and they're going to be telephone poles and they're going to be timber trees. There's no much life actually in a, in a deciduous woodland after about the first 15 years until it gets old. So what we're trying to do is say, We've lost all their, the giant elms which covered most of Britain. The giant ashes have gone. The, the treescape of Britain has been so denuded, and that's not even mentioning the, the, the agriculture, which has lost the most of them as well. So what we're hoping to do is get you people to come on board and pressurise for, if you like, the, grant, the grants you get for planting trees, not to be for numbers, but... But, but for what, uh, for, for a few. So instead of planting a hundred trees, you plant a hundred open grown trees. And each one of those open grown trees equals 50 trees in a woodland. 
well, plantation. And in, then, because we're, then we're really talking, because then you start talking about carbon capture, and what do you get? An open-grown tree is just a giant dome, 360 degrees. It's a dome designed by nature. Now, try and beat nature. Try and beat it. Don't, don't. Admire nature. Admire the sophistication of nature. Don't try and beat it. Leave it alone. Leave it. Be, don't be so patronising humans. And look what we're doing. We're on the way out now. And it's skidding, skidding down the track. How long it's going to be? I'm, I'm, I even got to the point where I thought, what the bloody hell am I writing this book for? Because it's, it's going to be, can't use the word in front of the ladies, but that's what's happening. That things are happening to the planet much faster than we ever thought. So get out there and start planting open grown trees. And of course, uh, in the article I wrote in, in, um, in the AA mag, I point out, that all you people were, were laying in bed and your, your parents were teaching you Red Riding Hood. Red Riding Hood coming out of the dense, dark woodland. So you're all dense, dark woodland people, but you were conditioned. Okay, so we're still trying desperately to shift, shift, the, um, shift the, the woodland trust to stop numbers, but start talking about beautiful landscape trees and all the rest of it. And the man next to him, that's my Townsend, one of the finest men I ever met. Now, I've got a lump in my throat. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. He was the person that gave Jill a job. He had the vision to see what he had and what she could do and and, and, and the vision with the, with the Woodland Trust. Unfortunately, he never stopped the, the numbers game. So that, they're still in their plantation paranoia. Good old Mike, I might meet you one day because you are a fantastic man. Thank you, Mike. Yes, sir. Getting on. So this is, it says, I think it says, my semptius. But this was one of the things that came out where Mike was definitely involved. These are part of the Ancient Tree Forum, which was started by us. I mean, I think, I mean, I'm just trying to go through it. One, um, two, three, four. I, it was partially ARBs and partially people from the countryside. Please look at the number of women. And then, that, and of course, only half of them there. But what is interesting is that this group has virtually stayed together for nearly 20 years. And at some stage, we were being bankrolled by the national um, natural England and they, they dropped us and I turned to Mike that was seen the last picture and said can you help us Mike they didn't even take a breath he just said of course I can we're a charity so are you and we're 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 bankrolled you and that's what they did so the ancient tree forum was specifically targeting the value of Britain's old trees, because we had them. We, we still got the highest proportion, even even north of Spain, in north of the Pyrenees. And, and we should be proud of that. And on our travels around the world, it's obviously evident that most of the young arbs or the arbs in those countries don't have old, old trees, and they don't have hollow trees. So we are still way ahead of the pack. And I think you saw the picture of the oak tree, oak tree going down, drying, going downwards. Well, that's a perception most arborists outside Britain never get to see. They never get to see the aging process of trees. I think this case is quite, it's quite noticeable when you're with them. They don't get to see, and they, and, and then the young arbs that are climbing trees now in Britain, they, some of them are certainly in middle aged trees going up and feeling middle aged trees as they climb and all the rest of it. And Reg Harris talks about climbing trees and sometimes he feels 
that they're welcoming. Well, I can't say. I haven't got any teeth. Welcoming them now. And so we have this duty now, I think, to look after especially Europe's old trees. And at Windsor, we started this um, graft. And then it was, um, I hope he's there. My friend, where is he? Murray, Murray. Murray, what's his other name? But Murray, everybody's, no, anyway, they can't hear, I can't hear you, I suppose. Can you hear the word Murray? Who's, what's Murray's other name? No. So who was Murray? Sorry, I missed that. Murray, who is Murray? What's his other name? What does he do? He's an arborist. Murray from, uh, they've got the cuttings from the Pontefana Oh, uh, Simpson, Murray Simpson. Murray Simpson. It was an arborist that got the big Ponfanic oak. It's a massive oak tree, one of the biggest in the world. It was, and it blew over. Murray, as an arborist, got some cuttings and gave some to Pete Wells, who I hope is listening. It was, it turned, it was a retiring, and he grew them on grafts, and he gave some to where I am at Windsor, and they grew them, and we got them to grow. They are now in arboretums, especially at Windsor. We've started an arboretum of Gene Bank ancient oaks. And that's the start of getting people to realise that these precious trees, and Mick Crawley, a friend of ours, um, Professor, he talks about the genes of these trees being absolutely precious for society and science. And they cannot be re replicated. They are unique trees. And they're doing it. And that was an R, did it? And now we do other trees as well. Um, uh, where else have we been? Like, anyway, that's, I'm going off piece a bit. But, um, so, Murray, good old Murray, thank you. So, what else? Oh, and that was Mike Tyler Townsend. So, he actually, if you like, kept us ticking away until now they formed another group, which I think is self-funded. Self, uh, and the tree in front of you now is one of the ancient oaks at Windsor. And that is where it really all began, was this tree and some others like it. That's where really I kicked off, because I, I got the job of, um, if you like, being the go-between between, between Natural England, which is a civil service body, and the Crown Estate, which is another civil service body, and it was to, to really to look at dead wood conservation. And this is where it happened. And this is where I began my old trees. And if you look to the right-hand side of the picture, the tree in the background is a massive, great, Old, old oak pollard. Can you see it? But it's different from most oak pollards in Europe because it's cut about four meters up. And I think in, in this particular place at Windsor, nearly all the pollards are high cut. And it was for, um, hunting because this is where they rode after the, the, the animals, you know, the deer mainly, the red deer. And so they cut them high. So they can get the horses underneath. Come on, anybody got some questions? You're all bloody quiet. Give me something to get on with. We've so got some, we got some questions. We've got some questions in the Q and A Ted, if you want me to ask you a question from there. Well, let's see how we get on. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I mean Was there a rhetorical request for questions then, Ted? Um well, you don't actually want questions though? No? Yes, yes, but I just, I wanted, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how on, what I'm, how long I've been on and whatever. And I've got these lovely people, my friends, and they're not chirping in, which I hope they would do with different things. You know, that they're all good. Um, so anyway, well, let's, let's, some. Um, so that was the oak tree. And, and that is where we started the growing downwards. And here we got the growing downwards. Neville picked up on this and started that that whole era of reducing trees in the hope of keep by cutting by by um reducing them 
keeping them um, alive for much longer than blowing over or breaking down or whatever. So that is one of the initiatives that came out of that. But there were many people that looked at these trees and what we were seeing and thought, there's something, there's more to this. And so the old trees have played quite a part in people looking at trees and seeing them quite differently. Because the big problem has always been with arborists is, and foresters anyway, but the um, big problem is you cut the evidence down. And it's not there to see. So we need people, places like Windsor and Burnham Beaches where they can leave them. And you can go and study them. You are the brains of the outfit. You are the ones that should be asking the question, what am I doing? Why would it, why did I do that? Let's have a look at it. Is it, and, and, um, we've got people like, um, Mike Ellison now, um, doing, doing, um, what is he doing? Um, doing, um, um, workshops on health and safety. Um, because as he said, We've been banging on for 40 years, and there's many people, you can't shake them. But it's when they come into agriculture. And, and um, we, I was with bird groups, and they, they used volunteers. And they said that with using the volunteers in the bird groups, it's every 10 years. So a lot of the people I was preaching to 30 years, they're all dead. They're gone. So all that, that's gone. So we look, we're talking to another generation. And I wonder what the ages of the people I'm talking to now is. Because you have to go and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it because it's experience. But the more you cut down the old trees, the less the experience it is for the next generation. I'm getting angry. Right. Um, what's the next one now? Um, yeah, well, you've done the, the, um, Oh, yeah, it's the one with, yeah, you've got it in front of me. So, <clears throat> again, um, Kevin asked a question about my my role with fungi. Well, it was because we were working on a lot of plant diseases. But, and this is where I learned it, that most of the plant diseases don't kill their host. And it's like worms, itchy bum. They don't want to kill you. They want you to carry on having an itchy bum. And, and now there's lots of evidence that probably worms, because we've become so hygienic, we don't have itchy bum. And uh, the, the itchy bum with a, could be the um, worms that were, they were there were actually exuding chemicals and things which were, were, were inhibiting some of the nasty diseases we have, probably like Alzheimer's. And a few like that. And, and, but we got through, and we're now in the, what I call the cosmetic hygiene religion. You know, scrub yourself silly every day. Worst thing you can do if you lose anything other than water. Worst thing you can do. And obviously, as you know, when you have a, one of these douches with all that, all the soap and all that stuff on you, when you finish, You've taken all your natural um, biodiversity on your skin, which is important for you from the point of view of um, you know, immunity to different things and defense. The skin is your, your major defense against millions of different diseases, and you scrub them off. And then you've changed the pH of your skin, and you stink like anything because all the bugs that are in are in there in that bathroom or wherever you are, um, jump on you. So I mean, there's a lovely saying which you get from the epidemiologist, and that is that you smell of the person that was in there after before you. So you come out smelling of somebody else. So your wife gets a whiff of you and she doesn't want to know. Or she might want to know. Anyway, uh, so this is where I came. So I was trying to really impress people with the relationships between fungi and air trees. And it's, it's fundamental. It's, it just happens. You, you can't avoid it. So these are the wood decayers on this side, which recycle 
what drops out of that tree. This side are the mycorrhiza, which are the, the, the few food collectors. So they're the recyclers. And then they pass that, the minerals and nutrients and whatever, over to these chaps, which are, uh, but then give them to the tree. And the tree gives sunlight back to them. And then they give sunlight back to these people. It's just a circle. So dead, dead wood is fundamental and fungi are. And I got involved with some of these uh, groups, Facebook type people, about collecting fungi. And I said, my quote, quote was, if you want a tree, don't pick me. So in other words, to most arborists, trees are incredible, uh, sorry, fungi are incredibly important. And if we're going to talk about the decay process, then I think we've got to move to have another big webinar with people like Neville and Mike Allison, Reg Harris, people like this, where we, 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 we just debate it and bring in, um, um, uh, Lynn Body. And if you haven't got Lynn's book, you should have it. It's, it's fundamental. Um, and she's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So, um, and of course, the next picture, and that is where we are with the perception of fungal decay, I think, um, where most people see that and then put the, the, the cause of it down to those big brackets. Rubbish. This was probably a natural aging process influenced by a myriad of other organisms which were working and living with that tree. This is just natural aging process. But people see that, and, oh, I've got to get rid of it. But here at the putt in Windsor, there are so many of these trees where you can see the aging process what going through naturally. And you start to think, I can do something about that. I'm an arborist. My job is the conservation of trees. So I can help that tree, maybe take some weight out of it, or get rid of some of the competition around it. There's all sorts of many things which arborists can do if they don't cut the bloody thing down. So, yeah, um, so we must have another webinar. John, we must have a webinar and get, um, and get Lynn involved. We can um, do that, Ted. Hey? We can do that, no problem. Yep, well, here's, here's, this is another friend of ours. This is their friend Gerard in Spain. Um, and he, he came with us to Sicily. And before I get around, well, we'll do, we'll talk what about what he's doing. And we were out on one of these lava fields. So I was probably 20 years old or whatever. I don't know. But, um, but you could still see pine trees in the maybe 500 meters away. And we're right out on the lava field and Gerard spotted a pine seedling and that'd be Pinus nigra. Um, uh, and he excavated it. And on the right hand side of the picture, you can see it already had mycorrhizal fungi. Now, here's the question. Did the seed blow? that two or three, half a kilometre or whatever it was, that dis quite a large distance, right out onto the, onto the lava field, because it's bare as board, bare as a board, and the seed got established, but did the seed come with mycorrhizal fungi in the seed, or were the spores blowing about, and they, they, got, they got trapped or found their way down to the tree roots and made the mycorrhizal association. These are questions which to me, when we're really talking about plant health, is we should be working on to find out how do these things. So that tree now has got its uh, essential mycorrhizal fungi. They're protecting it, protecting it from nasty pathogens, as you call them. Oh, it's got a fight to offer. Oh, and or oh, and they're collecting the minerals and nutrients. So that tree basically is safe, and it will always be safe. And and I, 
I can't tell you enough how we to start organic nurseries again. Because in my lifetime, we, we, um, I, I remember talking to old foresters and they were lining out Scots pine next to a Scots pine uh, plantation. And I asked them why they were doing it. And they said, because if we do that, they grow better. Now, if you think about it, these old foresters had found that these trees grew better next to their to a tree of the same species. But now we can tell, we can say that because we've moved on a bit, we, we can say to them, this is because the mycorrhiza on those old, those, those Scots have, trans, have gone over and transferred to these young pines. But the young pines, in actual fact, may have come from a nursery because they would be organic nurseries in those days. This is before uh, man-made chemicals and herbicides and God knows what. And and so they've already been inoculated. I could go on for hours about how science moves in, but the old boys, in many cases, had come up with a reason or a solution. That's fascinating subjects. So how are we doing for time? Shall we move on to net now, Ted? Uh, no, I've got two more to do, haven't I? Yeah. In this, but yeah. So this is this is um, two people. Uh, that's Izzy. She's wrote in the written the book Wilding, and if you haven't read it, it's only nine quid. Read it. So she was a journalist, and he is a a farmer. And Nep, you should read it yourself. Read it. But they they start really restarted the um, the rewilding movement, which has taken place and happening all over the world now. This is the two that did it. And the tree behind it is how I met him, because I used to shout down at Merriswood, and somebody heard me down there, and he came to be employed by this man as a forester. And this man here, Charlie, said, um, what are you going to do about my tree? Because right down here is a massive great split, right? And look at the crown, a beautiful tree. And it's got tank cha chains in it, huge tank chains holding it up. And I said, well, I don't know. Uh, uh, so anyway, this guy heard me speak. I got introduced to Charlie. Um, I said I didn't know. I got Neville, Neville Fay. He went and had a look at it, did a crown reduction, and also all the rest of it. But in the meantime, we got to chatting to this man, and who, as I say, given up farming and gone into rewilding, and and um, he held two meetings with the the great and the good of Sussex, and they came and heard Neville and me talk about ancient trees and how you know. And we were looking for more and more um, support and everything to save these trees. So they went on, and this place turned into a magic, magic um, arc. I call it an arc because by rewilding and letting it go and then bringing the animals in, um, it all changed. It changed into a beautiful wildfire, wildlife area. And of course, he sells the Longhorns, which is a, an old ancient breed of Britain, and they're organic, of course. I mean, I've never seen a vet, um, and um, <clears throat> and uh, makes a fortune, and, and he's rewilding, and he's already got two other estates now. He's pulled in a lot of the billionaires of the world, and they're off on other places around the world now, buying up chunks of land to uh, g give the land a rest. And, and 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 if you like, make make money, but make money with nature. I I, I can't, can't tell you how it's it, the idea, the concept has exploded, and they're doing it, and it's logical. Now, when we first did it, now uh, down with Charlie, Charlie had got his long horns in, and yes, he does have to have a vet for TB inspection, and Jill went off and. Um, go back a bit further. So I met him 
and we wound, we wound him up about um, the old trees and all the rest of it, Jill went off and got, and if you haven't read the book, you should. It's written by Franz Vera. And it's all about trees, of course, and it's common sense stuff. But we went to see Franz Vera in, um, in Holland, where they've got this great big rewilding area and saw the animals. And then the next day we went off to see where they were meandering the Rhine, which in actual fact, in the floods last year, they attribute the re meandering of the, of the Rhine and uh, uh, the floods being reduced by this meandering. So this may huge nature reserve now is we saved towns and villages below the, the flooding on the Rhine. But I was there and the, the, the Willie Overmars, his name was, he took to, he took us to the Rhine. And of course, being Dutch or German, perfect, beautiful uh, track, uh, which you can cycle and walk and down. And, and we stood in amongst a, a, a small herd of Galloways, you know, the belted, the black and white cows. And there was a bull and there was some big old cows, mature cows. There were the heifers and there were the calves. And they're all standing around and we were standing amongst them. And on the path, there were joggers, mountain bikers, walkers. And then a lady came along with a little dog and a, a child in a wheelchair. And I saw Charlie look at the little girl and the dog and the wheelchair, pushchair, not a wheelchair, pushchair, and then look at this bull. And I thought, he's going home. He's going home to do rewilding. And of course he did. And now where Charlie goes and Izzy, where they go, others follow. So that is a tree, a Merris Wood tree history of how the us arborists have, have pushed things along. And not one of you is out there believing that you had anything to do with that. And, and, that, and this is why I find so hard. And this is where Charlie rang me up one day and he said, you've got to come and see this. So on both sides of that track are fields which have had, uh, and they're, not, they're no longer intensively arable. So no pesticides, no herbicides, um, no fertilizers. And some of them have had some wildflower mixes put down. But this is an ancient footpath across his fields. And he, Charlie had not ploughed or receded or done anything to this ancient footpath. So he let the pigs go. And where did they go? They ploughed up the footpath. And they haven't gone into the land on either side. So although that's three years out of being drenched with poisons, it's not recovering. So that shows you actually what we're doing to our poor old planet. And trees are telling us this, but your knowledge is not getting passed on. No, no. Trees, trees that are in a bad way in the world, and you're seeing them every day, and I guarantee you're seeing more every year. We're seeing more and more diseases increasing. Why? Why are they susceptible? Because, and nobody, nobody, except Neville, Neville is, wherever he is, good old Neville, um, he is really looking at below ground. So if I can get some of you people talking, I could go on for hours and I, I, I'd wind up whenever you want me to. So go on, lasses, ladies and gentlemen, please help me. Go on, Sarah, your chance. Go on, go for it. I think it's time for some questions, John. You must have plenty of questions from people. I have got plenty of questions here. Uh, right, I can pick a couple at random. Here's a random one, Ted. Martin says, what's your opinion on wolves being reintroduced to Scotland to help control deer population? It needs 10 years. 20 years before before society will accept that. 
And I think what we've got to think about is we're pandering to journalists, people that want stories all the time. I mean, we know for a start, anyway, <laughs> wolves don't decode. Well, wolves or other predators do not um, in, uh, really influence their, their prey species. It's rubbish. It's just old, it's old shit. Um, and um, the world basically is run on, uh, I've got a piece of paper which I haven't used yet. Um, it, it, it's it's um, misleading. Uh, let me run. I don't know where it is. But sweeping statements. That this is what I wrote. Sweeping, unsubstantiated, unsubstantiated statements. And we all run on it. We all run on it. And when it, so much of it is not questioned. And in the world of arboriculture, you should have the confidence, as you're the profession, to ask these questions and push, push the organisation forward and say, the AA, or whatever it is, the AA says, this is what's happening. Don't wait for the scientists. They don't know. They don't know. I mean, I'm not allowed to go down to Alice Holt to the research centre. I'm banned because of the questions I ask them. Because they don't like to admit they don't know much about the individual tree. They're foresters. And the idea of wolves, I mean, even where they are, they don't control the animals. Does that do it? I go yeah, that absolutely does it. Thank you, Ted. Mean misleading, unsubstantiated perceptions. Jill, you said there's ten major rants. We've had two or three. Is that is that another one? Are oh, you on mute, Jill? You're still on mute. I can see she's on Sorry. mute. Sorry, I'm not going to tell you any of the others. But oh, just no, no, way. On, no, no way. I'm a pro. Okay, we'll see. We'll see if we can stumble on one. Um, Ted Benny's asked if you could quickly elaborate on why you don't seem to worry about phytophthoras, etc. But again, it's another wind-up. Every plant on the planet has a phytophthora. Okay, it has it. It's natural, and most of them um, live with the plants. But what happened was. Some of them now, because of susceptibility of the plants, plants have taken off. So normally phytophthoras only personified themselves after the tree was under stress. And that was normally in droughts. So the trip, the plant or the heather or whatever it is goes under stress and the phytophthora, which is living with it, living with it, yeah, eats a few roots, eats a few leaves. That then kicks off. And everybody blames the phytophthora. But it's, um, how can I put it? It's something you live with. I mean, uh, in the, the best best one is, it's probably going to be COVID because it's a virus. But um, um, if you take shingles or chicken pox, you get chicken pox as a kid, lots of, lots of nasty spots. And then you get the same the species lives inside you for, I don't know, 40, 50 years. And then one day you get it and it kills you, and it's called jingles. So I think um, <clears throat> it is the it's the perception of the sweeping to statement. And yes, the new arrivals that hybridise, um, which aren't in, would normally not be natural, is why the phytophoras took off. But you've got to ask yourself: is they must have come before. The, the, the hybrid phytophoras or the new phytophoras, I don't care what you say, must, most of them must have come before. So we've start, still got to look at why the trees are susceptible. Um, Unsubstantiated yeah. sweeping statements. Thank you, Ted. I've got another one I really want to ask you. Then we can open up to, to Kevin and Jill and Sarah and anyone else. But what I'd like to ask you is from Dawn, but it's from Dawn saying, um, 
Here's a question from my eight-year-old, inspired by the photo of the elms. Are there any large elms left in the UK? Where can Dawn's eight-year-old go and see some great elms? Yeah, there are a few, yeah. Yeah, scattered, very scattered. And Jill's got a finger up. Go on, Jill. So, uh, look on the ancient tree inventory, because elms are recorded on the ancient, elm, uh, ancient tree inventory. You go on to the website, and there's a filter system. You can filter out the elms, and then you can filter size, ancient, veteran, all sorts of filters uh, to, to home in. And you'll get a, uh, the only thing is you'll be close in on a particular area, and because they're very rare, what you need to do is zoom right out so you can see the whole country, and then you'll find that there's a, a very great number of very, very... Uh, big elms all across the country. I once did a map printout of all the ancient and veteran elms, and uh, there was quite a distribution. A few more in Scotland, of course, because the elm disease, um, for all sorts of reasons, uh, slow getting there, um, which elm are possibly a little bit more resistant, um, uh, all sorts of reasons. Um, probably a few more in Scotland than in the rest of uh, England, but uh, lots. And um, smoothly, a smooth leaf elm is a little bit more resistant. Um, and some of the Cornish elms uh, seem, uh, seem to be resistant, although Cornish elms is, I mean, there are three main elm species, but that's a whole other story again. But yeah, look at the ancient tree inventory. And you'll soon find loads. And there's loads of information about exactly where they are, often a photograph, just so you can see from sitting at your chair, on your chair, by the computer, uh, some lovely, lovely trees. And and it was Jill that took it off, that kicked off the ancient tree hunt. Well, the Veteran Trees Initiative had kicked off the specialist survey methodology, and lots of individual sites were collecting lots of details about trees, but that was being kept in one kept in one location, kept by the, the management of the site, really. And um, it, was, it was an initiative to try and uh, collect a national database of these incredibly important trees. And, uh, uh, and so the whole idea was, let's use citizen scientists to you know ordinary people to help us collect the information mm -hmm. and it's been an astonishing thing because <laughs> i can't tell you everybody gets it um if you can reach out to the majority of people they understand what is a big old tree and what should be recorded obviously they might overlook an ancient hawthorn or an ancient blackthorn, or something like that. That's for us specialist tree people to keep our eyes open and record. But they they are, you know, all of the trees, many, many, many thousands of the trees on the ancient tree inventory have been collected by people who are, are just keeping their eyes open. There are still many more to record. They're still coming in. Rob McBride, showed some fantastic pictures on Facebook of really, really unusual oak with a fantastic skirt on it. Uh, that just the other day, absolutely superb trees, fascinating trees, lots of stories still to be found, uh, trees still to be recorded, found, uh, and added to the database. And Jill kicked it off. We can thank her, and I will moan at Arborist because to get arborists to go out and record trees, it's, we can't do it. If you look at the people that are recording the trees, they're just ordinary folk. And let's face it, in the long run, we need that data. So next time you're out, measure a tree. And I, and I should say, I should say, Ted, also, as trustee of the Tree Register of the British Isles, which is about collecting information about champions, uh, then there are champion elms. And the wonderful thing about the Tree Register is that it's got records reaching into the past. Uh, many elms would have been recorded by the great late Alan Mitchell, uh, but also historical records as well. So uh, don't forget to look at the Tree Register database. 
The thing about the tree register database is that you do have to become a member, but it's not expensive. So become a member and uh, look out for champions as well. Jill, we should add as well that in Scotland, at least, UHI are currently doing a uh, there's a PhD student looking at mapping all of the elms that have been under recorded. And so they'll be added on later on. So that yeah. that works going because it's like even here in a botanic garden um, on the edges of our landscape in Dundee, we've got massive elms that were under recorded, not put on the list. Um, and that's somewhere where we're collecting data about. So I'm going to share it with the ATI, though, Kevin. Yeah, well, you get them to share it with the ATI yeah. because the idea is that we need to gather as much of the data as possible and then obviously <laughs> take over the world. First of all, Europe. Let's get a big map of Europe as well going. Um, and then obviously there are other countries which are collecting data as well. There's uh, initiatives in Australia. America has got its big tree enthusiasts as well. So, you know, let's let's try and put uh, big old trees on the, um, mm. uh, uh, let's get them recognised and understood and let's see them. Let's see the trees. Yeah, well, I mean, surely. Yeah, oh, somebody's geez. mentioning monumentaltrees.com. Absolutely fantastic website. Uh, again, collected, often collected by enthusiastic am amateurs. Um, so, yeah, absolutely wonderful. Yeah, um, and... These arborists are out there every day. Surely you love your trees. Surely it, it, it's, it takes a couple of minutes just to record a tree and, 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 and makes your, your profession much more interesting. And then to go and look at the map and see, cool, oh, I've just got a tree which is, uh, you know, one of the, the fifth or the sixth largest ones in Britain and things like that. And we cannot get arborists to do it. Well, some of them are, but it would be very oh, helpful so, if yeah. more were. Go on, John. Okay, well, thank you all very much for that. Thank you, Dawn, and please thank your eight-year-old. Great question from her, and lots of uh, lots of elms to go and see and an arborist of the future by the sound of it. So that's really good stuff. Um, to our little panel here, Jill or Sarah or Kevin, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to either mention or raise specifically about the book, really, or to ask Ted or uh, or anything like that at all. I've got more questions here I could ask, but we're here to talk about the book. I don't know if you want to say anything about that. I've got, I've got a question uh, because it, it's weaved into Ted's talk tonight, and many of the chapter headings, actually, are filtered out really nicely with the pictures, um, but also with the, with the subtext that's going on. And one of the things you talk about, Ted, is the web of causation. I wonder if you could just elaborate upon that. Um, well, I, that came from the medicine, um, sorry, but the health industry in Britain or, or America, where scientists looking at diseases were looking not at what the disease did, but why was that individual or whatever susceptible? And so... I took that because my friend's a pathologist. Um, um, he's the one that's the itchy bum uh, expert. So I can talk a lot about itchy bum if you want to. Anyway, but um, he, he was listening to me and he said, well, who's looking at the web of causation? You know, why have all these millions of aphids suddenly arrived and killing, killing the, the, the spruce or the, the spruce beetle? Why is that all happening? Why have these phytophoras all taken off? Yeah, you name it. And red band, uh, red band is now a big issue in the Forestry Commission world. But when I used to collect 50 years ago, when I used to collect material to show to the students, I was finding red band and giving it to the students. And there it disappeared. And now it's flattening Areas of Pinus nigra, I don't like the word Corsican, and, and, and you have to ask yourself. And then the best one, of course, is now you've really got me on my trolley, but it is oak mildew. Oak mildews. When 50 years ago, when I used to collect oak mildew, it was only on young trees, lammas growth. Okay. And in that time, it pro that because there was more than one of them, more than one oak uh, mildew, it progressed to become into the mature trees, 
and all over them. It stopped coming in, in, in the spring, in the wind, from somewhere down in lowland Europe. It now overwinters on the thing. So in 50 years, this oak mildew has developed, not just here, all over Europe, and, and, and it's in North America now. One of the oak mildews is a mildew of mango, which is tropical, and the other is a mildew of rubber. Both tropical things, but they've been here over a hundred years, 140 years. So a long time before any suspicion of global warming or the fact that global warming could have some uh, effect. So then you think about it and you think of the millions that are being spent, taxpayers' money, on trying to find the reason for oak decline. And you say, well, did you talk to us? Because arms would tell you that mildews are constantly reducing the photosynthesis um, um, uh, potential of a tree. So less and less every year the trees are photosynthesizing because of the oak mildew. Surely, if they've been doing that for 40 years, gradually, and they're reducing the um, amounts of um, um, energy that the trees need, then why don't they look at that? No, they went off and studied a bloody beetle. And, and so I think in a way it's that the wedge of causation starts you off lower down, you know, lower down. If you like, why is the beetle increasing? Why? I mean, we've got the OPM now, oak processionary moth. And everybody's all oh, spraying the trees and God knows what. They're killing everything. So when they, when when it was getting near Windsor, uh, because Windsor's a national nature reserve and all the rest of it, I just said, why don't we have an area where this oak procession moth is allowed to do its own thing? And because Windsor, of all the places between Asia and here, is one of the last great reservoirs of old trees, which presumably have the reservoirs of insects and bugs, which might eat the oak processionary rock. So that fell on deaf ears. And what happened? We wait a few years and David Humphreys at Hampstead Heath gets three or four parasites or parasitoids which are eating oak processionary rock. So they've missed the spray. And now nature is going to balance it all out. You're not going to get rid of oak processionary wrath, but if we are using nature to suppress it, then it'll happen. But the main problem is because man still thinks he knows better than nature, and it doesn't. And there's a brilliant lecture, which I'd love to get hold of again, but I think I've lost his name. It's an American, American on the mistakes we've made by but being patronising towards pests and diseases that we cure them. And there's not one. Not one. The only ones you'll get are the ones on the bird islands where they go in and they manage to eradicate the mice and the cats and the rats. And then the bird, the seabird populations build up. And there's one case in southern New Zealand where uh, the cabbage white, air cabbage white, got into southern New Zealand somehow and started munching away on some of their rare plants and the local people together with scientists eradicated the um the the the, 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 the large white butterfly their cabbage white butterfly it's it's oh I, I wish we would look at the, the results of some of the stupidity what we've done and and that probably is a a, a book must be a book and i can't think of the, the american's name you must have more, Kevin. Come on, give us a. Well, I, I was. Just, I mean, you talked all about tree ecology, and I just wondered because you know, rather than the other way around, you often ask ask me what my thoughts are on tree ecology. In fact, you may, ended up getting me to speak at the conference two years ago about it. But I was, what do you think a tree ecologist would look like? What do you think we should be spending our time doing in terms of that next? Um, that next phase of our growth and development. 
Well, we were going to sit down and talk about this. We were, but I'm just teasing out of you now. We do it in front of everyone else. This is your psychology. And you're in the, arm, in the armchair now, aren't you? Well, I would... Uh, I mean, what I want to do with you is we get a list of people um, and they've got to talk English. Not complicated. One of the problems with arborists, they, they like impressing the world with with um, long names and that sort of thing. It doesn't mean anything. It, you know, me, my boss used to say, if you, use an, if you use a complicated word, you've lost half your audience. We're not in the game of passing more wins. We're, we're in the game of trying to help these people come out and see that they know a lot, which we need. And, I mean, he might be listening. May have mind Steve is an arborist, but he was also a tree sculpture. And Lynn Body, the, 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 the fungi lady, she was, is working on some experiments up in winter. And we got Steve, he lives locally to me. We got Steve to do some chainsaw work with him, you know, with a small saw and all the rest of it. And I saw him talking to her all the time. And, when we got in the car to go home, he said, she keeps saying she doesn't know. And, and it because his perception, like most arborists are, that these people know. They don't know. that A good aunt, a good scientist wants to know. So a good scientist is a listener. And then if they do know something more and they can encourage the thinker to think more, then that's great. So his... Thinking was raised, raised up because he knew he had an opinion. But most arborists don't believe they have an opinion in the tree world. They're fundamental to the tree world. I see it. And, you know, speak up, speak up. You are already tree ecologists. They've taught me tree ecologists and now I'm shouting back at you. Is that what you wanted? So what we've got to do is inspire some of the people that care as much as you and me do to try and write in simple language some something for the tree people. Like, I mean, Neville is good at that. Neville is now um, into the soil, soil world. So he's forgotten about the tree. He's, uh, no, sorry, he's forgotten about the tree above ground. He's looking at the tree underneath. And that is fundamental. And so we want to talk to somebody um, in my day, there were big maybugs and the grubs that size, huge grubs. And they live in the tree for three or four years, but they live in the roots. So what do they do? To, what do or what they haven't done to a tree? That's maybugs, stag beetles. Um, there are, I think it's 14 or 19 species of aphid that live on root tree roots. Never come above ground. Never come above ground. The nematodes, these are the microscopic worms. They, they eat tree roots, they eat mycorrhiza, they eat mycelium. We don't know enough about them. So we're still looking at the tree above ground holistically, and we shouldn't do. More. <laughs> Gone all night. I mean, what is the time anyway? Well, it's it's twenty to eight, so we probably wind up in the next couple of minutes. We, I mean, we've still got almost five hundred people watching, so there's five hundred people who haven't been able to find anything uh, good on TV. Um, so God bless you all. Uh, is there anything we want to kind of close up with or finish off with? Again, particularly about the book, maybe, but I'll do a little plug for the book at the end. But Jill or, or Sarah or Kevin or any thoughts you want to close with, or Ted, anything? Anything you haven't said, you'd like to say, to get off your chest? Well, if we're winding up, now get, come on, come on, get Kevin's got something to say. Go on, Kevin. Well, I, I mean, I was, I was just going to point out, I mean, the whole book for me, having, uh, I've read it online, so I haven't got the copy yet, because I'll get, I'll get that. Um, being sent up but in terms of uh, what I what I reflected on was that in a way Ted you exemplify in a human form what we're trying to explore in this world with trees now, I think it's probably the exposure you had to all of that bacteria and soil with the road iron and reds but you've become more than just being human you've, you're part of this you've absorbed that nature around you and what we're learning 
about trees. They're, they're not, you know, Alan Rayner and Limbody taught us an awful lot that a cell of a tree is not just a cell of a tree. It's also a home for those latent fungi. And, you know, when we, when we prune a tree, we change the dynamics in that living system. We allow oxygen to come in and start a chain of cascade, which is basic ecology. If we step out and think about what it means to be an, a tree ecologist, again, you exemplify it. You know, you've, you've asked questions about the interaction and relationship between the trees and their environment. You've gone after trying to answer them. And you've certainly poked me a few times in terms of trying to find out what, what do we know about it? And I don't know everything and nobody does. But the structure and function of those trees and their role within the ecosystems they sit in, not just the ones now, but landscapes are a palimpsest and a cultural landscape very often that we've changed so trying to pick out what was it like before people when mm. those animals were running through that landscape and the interaction was bigger than the system we see today with you know tractors and petrochemicals and mm. all the rest of it that interaction with those other organisms and i guess the way that those organisms and well now with the climate changing the influence of the environment on them, on the growth and distribution, and let's face it, the survival of the trees. So in that respect, Ted, you are you are that example to us. Uh, and I think at the other side of it, it, it sort of, in my own practice experience, you've opened up a lot of questions that will take more than one lifetime to answer, but they're going to be fun having a go, eh? Anybody else going to shout? Because Joe? Uh, well, Ted, I mean, it's been an amazing adventure going on all those trips with you. I think um, the book is fascinating because uh, often we know that when different aspects of science come together, um, the spin-offs or different people from different walks together come together. Uh, the spin-offs are enormous because people are learning, are taken out of their, uh, their narrow confines the thing is, you exemplify that in one person because of the breadth of your experience in all sorts of ways. You know, you've been a, a, a top uh, bird watcher in the past. You've, you've been a major um, person in terms of fun collecting fungi or understanding and looking for fungi. Um, and you've had this uh, amazing experience in terms of your life as a whole. And now you've been so far around the world, you know, most most continents except I think Antarctica. Um, you've you've been and met people, and you're always talking to people, and that's what comes through. I think this business that you are always uh, talking to people, picking up new ideas, sparking off that, and I think that comes through in the book. It's full of new, interesting anecdotes and. Uh, you know all of the collected wisdom that you've picked up on your in your eighty nine and a bit years. Well, Sarah, go on, have a laugh. Well, I think it's fair to say that having read this book myself many times now, we've barely scratched the surface of what's in it with the conversation this evening. But the bits that that you've talked about are fascinating and were fascinating to me the first time I read them and continue to be so but I would say to everybody just go and read it if you want to learn about all the things that Ted has talked about but if you also want to hear about Ted being in Portugal during the 1966 World Cup and what he thinks about whether the Duke of Wellington's horses might have introduced fungi to Windsor from their hooves when they came back from Spain and what it's like to climb up trees to survey sparrowhawk nests when you're just wearing a pair of plimsolls then all of that is there for you in the book as well so it's been an absolute joy to work on and I think you'll get a lot of joy out of reading it anybody who does so yeah okay well um I got a lump in my throat because um, it, it's it's there to be asked, and it, I, I feel like somebody that can see through the Arboriculture Association, and I want to push them. Come on, look at look at yourselves. 
see yourself as professionals, see yourself as um, the people that can answer a lot of the questions which scientists will never do. They've never been up a tree. They never, you know, they never swung about on a branch or any of that sort of thing. And, and constantly they should be asking you, what do you think? Or what did you find when you were there? And all the rest of it. And I could go on for hours about seeing the people with that lack confidence in saying things. And that is what gets me, that they, they won't speak out. And um, I could go on for hours how I've upset a lot of people because I did speak out. But they, they don't remember the people that don't speak out. They remember the people that do. You know, you think of the people that you remember in your life. Um, Arthur Scargill, um, Mrs. Thatcher, Winston Churchill, whether you like them or not, you remember them. You don't remember all the other prime ministers or whatever. You remember the people that are prepared to say, I think, or I, what do you do? And, and, and that's where I am. So just to finish up, I, I wrote, did write down some of my comments. And the one that I said the other earlier on, which was, you know, if you, if you're wrong, don't be afraid because you learned something. And, and, and also you've got to remember what Mark Twain said. Mark Twain said, no matter how much evidence you give them, you'll never convince an idiot. And I can't wait to use that. But I've not been in a situation where I can really say it to a hall a hall of hall of people where you've got somebody pumping to pumping and pumping in. But I will do it. Um, I promise you. So and there's another one which I think bears out a lot of what I think which pl applies to the, the arbicultural people is nature does not follow or a dear, a dear to man-made definitions and constructs or laws. So you, we have made the, we have made these nature laws and whatever, but nature didn't do it. So, but you're at the rock face. So you're seeing the trees. And it was a bit like me in the beginning with those hollow trees. Everybody was happy with hollow trees being unsafe and diseased and cut them down. And now, I, I, okay, I got it wrong. I went over the top too far, but it made people think. And I think, but that is not just me. That's in every, every arborist I mean. So when you buy this book, and you will buy, of course, because the money will go back to the Arb Association, um, to, to get Kevin and people like him, uh, talking about tree ecology. And the interesting thing was, the book was paid for. I paid for the book already to go with John. And I got a letter to say I'd won 25 grand on premium bonds. Now that's, that's serious. That's kinky because we've given it straight back to, 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 um, to John and that will go to the next book. Now, what do you think about that then? So I'll leave you with that one that this book, it's just part of a, a story. And if you're an arborist, you're lucky. And just to, when you go home or tonight or tomorrow morning, just go and put your hand on a tree and say, I am responsible for this tree and I care about these trees. When you do that, I think you become a real arborist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ted. And I have to say, I've said it to you before, Ted, but I'll say in front of all these people, it is incredibly generous as well what you've done with this book for the Arb Association. As Ted said, Ted's paid for it all, um, and the proceeds go to the Arb Association to help the work of the charity, and that's an incredibly generous gesture, and we really appreciate it. Plus, the book is genuinely brilliant, and it's been a great privilege that I've been able to read it twice, sometimes with a red pen for legal reasons, but, but I've read it twice and it's absolutely amazing. And I recommend you all get out there and get yourself a copy. So Jill, Sarah, Kevin, and of course, Ted, thank you all so much for a wonderful evening. We will do another webinar, I think, Mr. Green, at some point soon. Uh, thank you to all of my team here and thank you to everybody watching at home. Still more than 400 of you 
after almost two hours, which is pretty cool. And a mark ten, I think, of how how interested everybody is and how much uh, respect you're held in. It's been absolutely brilliant again. So thank you all so much, and good night. Yeah.